All right, just gonna ramble off the cuff here, answering some questions I received on Twitter, now known as X, whatever people want to call it these days. Um, hope the audio is fine. I'm just recording this on my phone, out in the, the city center in public. Um, nice day. Beautiful, expansive sky. And some of the questions that came in, a couple from Sasha, and one from, I don't remember the username, but they all kind of converged on uh, what is what a lot of people online are calling um, fourth path within the Theravada model of awakening. If you really want to read up in depth on this um, from a contemporary teacher who knows the territory, is versed in the tradition, um, and also has you know, practice experience in a couple of different traditions, I would really recommend you check out Stephen Snyder, his book, Demystifying Awakening. I worked with Stephen a little bit one-on-one. -on -one. He's fantastic. Um, decades of experience in Theravada and Zen. You know, lineage authorized teacher. You really can't get any better than Stephen in terms of like credentials and practice experience. And he's a sweet guy. Um, so yeah, recommend him as a teacher and his book. But people are asking me, so I'm going to give my take, flat my lips, and hopefully it won't do too much harm. Um, so it, I'm, I'm pretty, you know, orthodox. I'm not going to argue with Theravadans about their definition of what constitutes arhatship. Um, for them, that means the complete elimination, total purification of the mind stream of any residual, um, habitual uh, traces of, of clinging, um, such that, uh, you know, what we'd usually consider negative emotions, just, you know, that there's no possibility for them to arise. Um, the samskaras, the habitual traces laid down in a lifetime, or many lifetimes, if you believe in rebirth of delusion, um, those, those have all been burned up through the practice of absorption and insight. You know, jhana um, and vipassana, shamatha, vipassana. Um, that's their definition. You get, you know, a lot of uh, argument and uh, complaint if you uh, attempt to switch that up, as colleague uh, Daniel Ingram has. Um, so, speaking of Daniel, let's let's move on to that. So, the, the, the definition um, that is most currently in play in kind of online discourse is what Daniel talks about as... Uh, kind of his revised fourth path, four path model, um, or MCTB fourth path, which uh, is basically 24/7, always on, can't be otherwise, uh, non-dual uh, sensory perception. Um, and I mean, you can read Daniel's book; it's free online. Highly recommend it. Go to the chapters on different models of awakening. Um, I think in the book he states that his favorite model is the the, the simple non-duality model. It's also a good model that stands up to reality testing. There are people walking around, um, talking, recording videos, and you know, shit posting online uh, who enjoy such a, a changed phenomenology. Um, that one holds up to scrutiny. Um, and someone else asked, you know, what what is that like? Um, kind of day to day, real time, walking around, as Shinzen would say, uh, bopping around in the world. Um, and difficult to describe. <laughs> uh, vast. Um, there's no hard spatial boundaries anywhere. The visual field, the, the whole sensory flux is thoroughly and permanently dereified to a very great extent. Um, I mean, Shinzen talks about everything just becoming or being revealed to have always been um, simultaneously expanding, contracting space, you know, which is prior to any kind of subject-object structuring of the phenomenal field. And uh, I'm happy with that. That 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 fits. <laughs> um, yeah. So while thoughts, emotions, sensations, behaviors, habits, those all still operate. Everything is very loose, flowing, and, you know, depending on your life situation and how much work you've put into your psychology and, you know, uh, releasing trauma and working on behavioral issues, something like, you know, 90 to 99% of psychological suffering just goes. It's not, it's not here anymore. The body still aches, has pains, gets sick, old, dies. No, no avoiding that. No, that's just, just what happens to beings like us. But 
all of the mental perturbation <laughs> that comes from having a, an entangled... Um, in early Buddhist texts, they refer to the tangle within and the tangle without. And those are both thoroughly, thoroughly gone. Very nice. <laughs> um, worth every second of uh, deliberate effort. And what's clear is that it was always this way. Um, it's just habitual tension. Self-reinforcing feedback loops of getting the sensory system knotted up, reified. The other question that came in from Sasha was, uh, is, is this ever done? Is there an end point? Um, you know, in Theravada, there's a definite answer to that. Um, yes, of course. If you achieve fourth path um, by their criteria, uh, you're not coming back. The cycle of rebirth is cut short. No more will your mind stream enter into the womb. You won't be reborn. Uh, your awareness will, you know, you awareness in any sense that most of us will identify with will cease on death, the breakup of the body, and just release, full release with no more, no more contraction, no more restriction. Pari Nirvana, or Pari Nibbana in Pali. In later Buddhism, you know, you have, you have the Mahayana strains like Zen um, and Dzogchen, uh, which is where um, I've done most of my practice in the last couple of years, and I'm currently still working with Vajrayana and Dzogchen practices and still carry a lot of Zen influence. Um, that's very much on the Bodhisattva um, model, where, you know, uh, arhatship, this removal of the sense of a personal self, is not enough um, in those traditions, um, in, in their rhetoric. Um, our hearts ret retain um, subtle traces of, of ignorance um, that largely play themselves out in unskillful acts of body, speech, and mind that prevent them from otherwise becoming Buddha and benefiting sentient beings. Um, and so, you know, in the different schools of, of Mahayana um, and Vajrayana, there are all kinds of methods and practices that are believed um, to have great efficacy in burning off residual karmic traces so that um, one can fully show up and hear the cries of the world, you know, embody the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, tend to the suffering of the world, which you know, can't be ignored with your own sense of center and periphery and solidity dropped out, the, the pain and suffering um, all around become very, very salient because there's not so much of your own or you left. And so are you ever done with that? No, not, not really. I mean, there's the theoretical, you know, limit of, of Buddhahood, which is total purification of consciousness. You know, you've removed all conditioning. Um, can't say I've ever met anyone like that, nor have any of my teachers. <laughs> So if there are, if there really are some um, some living Buddhas around, um, that'd be neat. I don't know them, uh, but you can follow that asymptote um, to the limit. Continue to practice um, right up until your last breath for the benefit of sentient beings, relieving suffering. Okay, I think that's that's all I have to say. Um, I hope that was helpful. And um, don't take my word for any of this. I'm, I'm just some guy. All right. Take care. Bye.